Welcome to Leadership Lessons from the Fast Lane, brought to you by the Washington Speakers Bureau. In this space, we will explore some of the most pressing challenges that leaders face today with the world's most respected, innovative, curious, and accomplished thought leaders. We'd like to welcome our host, best-selling author and co-author of the recently published book, Choose Love, Not Fear, a WSB exclusive speaker for almost 30 years, Gary Heil. This is Leadership Lessons from the Fast Lane. I'm Gary Heil. There isn't a person on the planet more qualified to talk about leadership in the 21st century than our guest today, Walter Isaacson. Walter has served as the president of the Aspen Institute, the chairman and CEO of CNN, and the managing editor of Time Magazine. And in addition to his executive responsibility, Walter is the biographer of our age. From Einstein to Steve Jobs, from Ben Franklin to Leonardo da Vinci to Henry Kissinger, Walter has chronicled some of the great innovators who have defined our society today. My personal favorite, having grown up in Silicon Valley as a young leader, is the innovators. How a group of hackers, geniuses, and geeks created the digital revolution. In this book, I find that Walter challenges many of the traditional notions of what it takes to create an innovative culture. I am so proud you're here today, Walter. Thank you for joining us. Hey, it's an honor to be with you, Gary, and thanks for that exceedingly kind introduction. Oh, so true, though. I mean, Walter, as we begin and in context, I, I think we would agree if there's one thing leaders agree about the future, it's that innovation is going to play a bigger role in the future than it has the past. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, you grew up in Silicon Valley and we saw the impact of the information technology revolution, the fact that everything could be done in, you know, bits and bytes. I think we're also now, especially coming out of the coronavirus issue and uh, gene editing issue, we're going to see innovation in the biotechnology space as well. And those two innovation revolutions will come together where we'll have an information revolution about our life and our genetics and a uh, biotech revolution where we understand genetic code as well as computer code. And I think that that's going to really determine our life for the next century or so or part of it anyhow. And I think what's really interesting about this, whether we're in revolutions that are technology driven like that or whether I'm trying to figure out the new offense in college football or running an academic institution like Tulane. Everybody's talking about it, but I think the elephant in the room largely is the research is pretty clear. Most organizations are not very good at innovation and we need to get better. And I, I love your work in that it challenges what that might take. And I think any discussion to this, probably Walter, tell me if I've got your work right, probably begins with an understanding that we're not trying to find the really smart person who got the innovation gene at birth, that innovation is a team sport and, and a collaborative activity. Did I get that right? Absolutely. There are two things that I've learned in my very long career at Time Magazine and writing books in the Aspen Institute, which is that, you know, there are a lot of smart people in this world, but it turns out that smart people are a dime a dozen. You know, they don't usually amount to much. What matters is imagination, uh, the ability to be innovative, to think out of the box. And secondly, and I'm glad you like my book, The Innovators, because after writing a biography of Steve Jobs, I wanted to show it wasn't just about a guy who goes into a, his garage or garret and comes up with a light bulb moment. That innovation, as you said, is a team sport. It's a collaborative effort. And that's the theme all the way back throughout the history of innovation is that we have to learn how to form teams. And you know, teams, I mean, Freud was really down on teams. He thought teams dummied everybody down a little bit, right? And the truth is teams love, they don't like to admit it because none of us like to think we run with the herd, but we do. Teams love stability and predictability. And as you write, innovation is all about novelty. You know, you have to be able to disrupt, and that was one of Steve Jobs' great talents, which is, I asked him once near the end of his life, what's the greatest product you ever made? And I thought he'd say the iPhone or maybe the original Macintosh. Instead, he said, it's hard to make good products, but what's even harder and more important is making good teams that will continue to make 
good products. He says, but you have to make sure they don't get into a rut. For example, when he created the iPod, you know, a thousand songs in our pocket, it was this huge hit. And Apple's earnings were just, you know, dependent on the iPod. But he told his team, if the brain dead people who make cell phones ever figure out that they can put songs on cell phones, we're toast. So we're going to have to make a cell phone. And they said, but that will cannibalize uh, the iPhone business. And he said, if we don't cannibalize ourselves, other people will eat us for lunch. So he knew how to push disruption through a team, to have a team, but not let it get complacent. Yeah, and he wasn't afraid to fail either, right? If I remember right, the iTunes phone was a complete almost failure because it was like a Motorola Razor with a few songs on it, which seems kind of primitive now, but he wasn't afraid to get rid of that either. Right, so he does something with Motorola, it's a, the Razor-like phone, and then he realizes you got to control everything from the content to the software to the hardware, and so that's when he makes his own iPhone. And as you say, he understood failure well. He, uh, one of the defining three events in his life was in 1984 and 85, when he gets ousted from the company he founded, Apple, uh, because he had created this great machine, the Macintosh, but in some ways it was a market failure. It was overpriced and underpowered and it was just, you know, the whole thing was a bit of a mess. So he gets fired by his board, but that's one of the best things that ever happens to him because he knows, as he later put it, that the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Yeah, and that Think Different commercial was just brilliant. And it also is, it, it, your words, I love your words, when you said a rebellious sense of wonder. I think there's not a word lost in that to me. I, I, I was always interested in what you meant by wonder, but he was a rebel with a sense of wonder. And I, I, it's an amazing phrasing to me. But by the way, I look at everybody I've written about. Leonardo da Vinci, Albert Einstein, Steve Jobs, Ben Franklin, all had a rebellious sense of wonder. They were absolutely passionately curious about things around them, normal things that you and I, you know, I'm looking out, uh, it's New, you know, in New Orleans here, we've got blue skies. And what Steve Jobs wondered and Einstein wondered and Franklin and, and, and Leonardo all wondered is exactly why is the sky blue? They stopped and had that pause when they saw ordinary things and they wondered what caused it. And they were willing to think outside of the box. I mean, Einstein makes this incredible mental leap when he's looking at patent applications to synchronize clocks. And he realizes that time is relative depending on your state of motion because he's looking at what if you're moving really fast from one of the clocks to the other clocks. This out of the box thinking, this, this sense of being a rebel, feeling a little bit like an outsider, shared by all the great innovators I've written about, and they connected to their curiosity, their sense of wonder. I think curiosity sometimes atrophies as in our society with many cultures because we're paid for not making mistakes too many times and we've got to make quarterly earnings and nobody knows that better than you do. And yet, have you seen that sometimes people are talking about innovation on one side, but have sometimes let that curiosity muscle atrophy a little? Well, the curiosity muscle atrophies in, atrophies in two different ways. First of all, when we're young, the re there's a reason we call it our wonder years, is that we're, we're 9 or 10, or 11 years old, we're wandering around and, you know, we're, we're, we're curious about everything we see. I was walking uh, down Royal Street uh, yesterday and I saw something I see all the time, which is some kid asking his father, you know, why is that lizard brown? And then why is uh, it was something about some plant they saw or a mask in a window and finally the father says what fathers always say at a certain point which is shut up and quit asking so many stupid questions and we sort of knock the wonder years out of our kids and we outgrow our wonder years the secret to ben franklin leonardo da vinci steve jobs and einstein is they never outgrew their wonder years 
And of course, the point you made too is correct, is that if you're a manager of a company that has to make quarterly earnings, you have a disincentive sometimes to innovate, to uh, think different, to try something that might be a little bit crazy. Steve Jobs was always willing to do that. But I think, uh, you know, uh, we can see it in a lot of companies today, they get addicted to the quarterly earnings report and they do very well. They have good supply chains, they have good, you know, marketing, but they don't, uh, they don't put a dent in the universe. They don't think different. Yeah, and you know, I think it's your phrasing, Walter, not mine for sure, and I, I love it. I think you're, um, one of the quotes I wrote down from something you had said earlier was, they want to think outside the box, but they sure know what's inside the box. I know I sometimes I'll be talking about Einstein in, you know, in my speeches, people come up to me afterwards and they say, hey, you know, I'm just like Einstein. So what do you mean? He says, well, I think outside the box. They go, yeah, but he knew what was in the box before he thought outside of the box. That's something, you know, especially with Steve Jobs, you know, you really see people who understand every detail of their product. They're product people. They're not marketing people. They're not lawyers. They're not just finance people. They love the product. And that means knowing what's inside the box. You know, it's, it's funny. Stuart Maldahl, the founder of Raw Stores, said to me about a retail business that if you want to be innovative, the person in charge needs to be a product person because they have to understand the intersection of where design meets the business, right? Where I have to understand how to make the product, but I have to understand design, sort of art and science, humanity and science. Poetic science, was that a way you phrased it once? Well, you know, that was a phrase of Ada Lovelace, one of the great women I've written about at the very beginning of The Innovators and the last chapter of The Innovators. She was Lord Byron's daughter, but her mother tutored her in mathematics, hoping she wouldn't become a romantic poet. And she develops what she calls, you know, poetic science. And she understands, for example, how the punch cards that are weaving beautiful fabrics on the looms of England in the 1830s, how those punch cards can be used to do numbers or music or words or anything else. And she comes up with the concept of a computer and an algorithm and a general purpose computer. And to me, that's the type of th thinking that occurs when you stand at the intersection of the arts and the technology. And that sort of was what, uh, and I was reading in your book, that's what Jobs used to use in the beginning of his presentations, right? Was that the intersection of the street signs that he had? Yeah, he had a little street sign. He had street signs that showed the liberal arts and technology. And he said, that's where we stand at Apple. I mean, he was making a contrast you know, to some other computer companies. But he said, you know, those of us who can stand at the intersection of the arts and technology know how to connect emotionally to people. We know how to make products that makes their hearts sing. And, you know, Maslow once, I, I, I was thinking back to the days when I was writing about him, and, and all I could think of when reading your stuff was that Maslow used to say that one of the things we have underestimated in the world that we're moving to is art education in that we've lost some of our creativity and trained it out of people. Would you agree with him that this, this idea of liberal arts or art education in general becomes important to the scientist who hopes to innovate in biotech in the Valley? Absolutely, I mean, you look at Steve Jobs when he went to Reed College before he drops out, what courses does he take? He takes dance, he takes poetry, he takes calligraphy. You know, he reads the Odyssey. Um, he didn't take that many computer science courses. And he said, those who can connect creativity to the technology, connect to the humanities to the technology, are the ones who will succeed. I'm a huge admirer of Bill Gates. I think he's one of the great people on this planet. However, when he went to college, he took and uh, uh, applied math and almost all of the courses he took were applied math. So, you know, he ends up being very good at many things, but sometimes not good at that, that emotional connection you want to have with products. I mean, you know, Microsoft ends up making the Zune, you know, a music player that looks like it was designed in Uzbekistan mm -hmm. in a basement, whereas Steve <laughs> makes the iPod, which is an object of design, elegance, and desire. And they... 
And as they did these things, I, I think there was this really interesting conundrum for most of them in that they live in a world where speed matters, but creativity is traditionally a slow activity. It takes time to think and time to pause and takes uh, sort of being lost in the present a little bit at the same time the speed's happening around you. What did you find when you looked at these guys from Leonardo to Jobs to Einstein? There had to be sync time when I think about your going through all those pages and Leonardo of those workbooks and how much time it took to create those must have been just thought time as, in, as well as learning. You know, when, he, when Leonardo da Vinci was painting The Last Supper, the Duke of Milan was beginning to get impatient because he was taking, as usual for Leonardo, quite a bit of time. He was procrastinating or he would come in, do a few brush strokes, then stare at it for an hour and then leave for a while. And the Duke and the rector of the, uh, the monastery where Leonardo was painting The Last Supper kept saying, you've got to push, you've got to push, you're not working, you know, you're taking too much time off. And he, and Leonardo explained that when you pause, when you take some time off, when you reflect, that's when the imagination begins to gel and it turns into intuitions and then it turns into innovations. And he said, you cannot rush that process. Now, you know, I think it's, to some extent a shame. Leonardo really finishes only about 14 or 15 fully finished Leonardo da Vinci paintings, but those are a lot different than the hundreds of paintings that his contemporaries, you know, uh, painted. And he was the one who taught us that sometimes you have to pause. Sometimes you even have to procrastinate. Yeah, and he had so many other talents and interests that I was shocked in reading about him as to how many things he taught himself to be competent in. You know, when Steve Jobs was telling me about standing at the intersection of the arts and technology, and when we were discussing that as a theme of the book, and he said that was true of people you've written about in the past, you know, Ben Franklin, for example. And he said, at some point, you have to do a biography of Leonardo da Vinci because he is the person who most exemplifies that ability to stand at the intersection of the arts and sciences. In fact, the icon we have of that intersection is Vitruvian Man, you know, Leonardo's drawing of the nude guy doing jumping jacks in the circle in the square. And Leonardo did not make much of a distinction between art and engineering. In fact, he calls himself, when he's working both for the Duke of Milan and for the Medici family in Florence, he says he calls himself the engineer and artist to the Duke of Milan. And, you know, I want to ask one of the curators about some drawing he did, the fetus in the womb. I said, was that a piece of science or that a piece of art? And the curator said, Leonardo would not have made that distinction. And that, boy, that just, when you say that, it just, brings up in my mind a ton of the technology that we've seen work so well. Is it art or is it science? And it look almost the always iPod. is both. You look at the iPhone. Look, look, I mean, here, you know, look at my iPhone. It's a piece of art as well as a piece of technology. Boy, for sure. And, you know, to understand how somebody can actually do that, we have to, I think, in our cultural thought for the future, consider that scientific principle of note, the, re the reality distortion field yeah. that they live in, because to actually see that as possible, I mean, you picked up your iPhone. I think <laughs> what I was amazed at, having known a little about Apple over the years, was the Corning story that I had no idea that that face on the iPhone really the glass didn't exist in a product ever before, right? You know, when Steve Jobs was first uh, considering, you know, the iPhone and the iPod or whatever, he didn't want it to have a junky piece of plastic in the front. Uh, he wanted it to have a wonderful glass face that wouldn't scratch and wouldn't smudge and would feel good to your fingers. So he, uh, and the claves in China were not making glass that he felt was good enough. So he called up Corning and ends up meeting with Wendell Weeks, who's the CEO of Corning. And he says uh, to Wendell Weeks, you know, this is the type of glass I need. 
And Weeks says, you know, years ago, we came up with a formula called Gorilla Glass that would make something that was really tough and a type of glass that you would, you know, that you're talking about, but we never manufactured it. And Steve goes through the process with him. And Steve finally says, okay, I like it. And I need uh, this amount by September because we're going to ship the phones for Christmas this year. And Wendell Weeks says, well, no, I just told you we've never made it before. And Steve had been taught 20, 30, 40 years before to, by his guru in India to be able to stare at people without blinking and say, don't be afraid, you can do it. And that's the reality distortion field you're talking about. And so he says that to Wendell Weeks, who says, wait a minute, I know how to make glass. You do. And Steve just says, don't be afraid, you can do it. Well, the upshot is Weeks called a plant manager of his in Kentucky and said, I want you to start making Gorilla Glass. And the manager says, sure, I'll do it in a month or two. We're doing flat screen TVs now. And Weeks said, no, I want you to do it starting Monday. And the guy says, no, no, we don't have that. And Weeks said, I just kept telling him, don't be afraid, you can do it. And the upshot is every piece of glass on every iPhone and every subsequent iPad made uh, since then has been made by Corning in America because of Steve's reality distortion field. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting point though, isn't it? To be able to see reality, to be able to manage a business, but at the same time, not be tethered to or limited by yesterday's assumptions about what's possible. Is that pretty much common in almost all the people that you've studied or the, the cultures that you've seen where innovators have done great things? They just believe the impossible is not impossible? Yeah, I mean, they push things forward. They push the boundaries forward. They think out of the box. You know, what? I mean, Leonardo da Vinci is, of course, the ultimate in doing that. But I will add a caveat here. It's like when we were talking about thinking out of the box, you got to know what's in the box. Sometimes you have to know when can you bend reality. And sometimes you have to know when you can't bend reality. And whether it's a coronavirus or in Steve Jobs' case, pancreatic cancer, sometimes you can't just will it away. You have to follow the science and follow the rules. So the trick is not just being willing to have a reality distortion field and bend reality. It's being right at least 80 or 90% of the time about when you can bend reality and when sometimes you have to uh, abide by the physical rules. Yeah, it's sort of the problem with optimists in general is they don't always see reality and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, huh? Yeah, and uh, I do think that we have a deficit of optimism, a deficit of a willingness to bend reality, a deficit of a willingness to be imaginative and think out of the box. So I don't want people to get too cautious there but once you go barreling down that path and saying, I can bend reality, I can do things, I can think different, always pause and know what's in the box before you try to think out of it. You, you say in your work, uh, I love the term, uh, see the big picture and understand the details is what you're saying, right, too, is that people have to believe in the big picture that you're painting but if you're not into the details, this doesn't work very well, right? Well, you know, God is in the details, as Mies van der Rohe and others said, and the devil is in the details. And that's what made Steve Jobs so creative was he would take it. I mean, I'll go back to my iPhone here. He would show me exactly how his finger went around the curve of what he calls the chamfer and exactly the details of that curve and why it makes it feel so user friendly. You can look at Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks and over and over again, he's sweating the detail, whether it's of a machine he's trying to build or how you'd hoist uh, uh, a mirror or a concave mirror somewhere to focus the rays of light or how the optics work in the eye or how the smile of the Mona Lisa is gonna work. All, I mean, the smile of the Mona Lisa is the best example of God being in the details because he understood the face or the, as I understood from the book, he spent so much time really trying to understand the musculature of the face, right? And everything about it to be able to paint it. Is that right? Everything about it. I mean, for 14, 15 years, he has that by his side as he's trying to perfect it. 
and he does many scientific experiments. He understands that when you look directly at an object, the light brings into your eye the details, the fine points, the black and white details. But when you're sort of looking obliquely at something coming at you from the corner of your eye, you see the shadows and the colors better. And so from that and from knowing how the muscles, he dissected 14 human faces to know which muscles and nerves touch the lips. And from all of that, he was able to make a smile where if you stare at it directly and you see the tiny little details in the corner of the smile, it doesn't turn up. The smile turns off a little bit. It doesn't look like she's smiling at you. But as you turn your head slightly, as you move a little bit, the smile comes on. It's interactive. It reacts to you. That comes from sweating the details. That comes from 14 years of working on a smile. But this attention to detail and believing the impossible sometimes is possible and being rebellious doesn't always make you the most popular figure as a leader. It can be, as you say, not only collaborative on one side, but disruptive on the other. There's a bit of conflict. So many times I think we think that you're going to create this innovative culture where people sing Kumbaya all day. It's just not that way. Is it disruption is disruption. It's conflict. Right. Steve Jobs in particular was very disruptive and very, very rough on people. I mean, I begin my Steve Jobs biography with Wozniak, his, you know, longtime partner, saying the question you have to ask is, did he have to be so tough on people? Did he have to be so mean? And at the very end, I have Steve discussing it. I'll let people get to the end of the book and hear what Steve Jobs has to say. And Wozniak at the end says, if I had run Apple, I would not have been so mean. I would have not have been, I would have run it like a family. But then Woz pauses and says, but if I had run Apple, we probably wouldn't have done the Macintosh. So it's a careful balance there of how tough and mean you have to be. And there is no right answer. You should not read a biography of mine and say it's a how-to book. Other people, as you know, and you're, you know, you know, a lot of them write seven easy lessons for success. Me, I write biographies because the lessons you learn from Steve Jobs are a little bit different from the ones you learn from Ben Franklin. Steve Jobs was a very disruptive leader. He was able to push conflict, but then he got people to do things they didn't know they'd be able to do. On the other hand, Ben Franklin was a very collaborative leader. He always could reduce the tensions in a meeting or in a room. And he was able to bring people together almost with a Socratic gentle questioning and get people to feel comfortable with one another. Well, both of those are leadership skills and both of those are needed at separate times. And as you said at the very beginning, leadership isn't just a singular art, it's a team sport. So when you're creating a team, like Intel, one of the great corporate teams ever created, you need to have a disruptive person like Andy Grove, who's going to drive people nuts and get them mad. But you also need a person like Robert Noyce, who is calming and will bring people together. And so whenever I was running an operation, Time or CNN or the Aspen Institute, I'd say, what is my style? And my style tends to be more collaborative. I don't, you know, I'm not an aggressive, tough boss. But I made sure my right-hand person knew how to be aggressive and tough when the time was necessary. That creates teams that have diversity on them. And you write about the collaborative part works when we're all not the same and the diversity of information. And you write that it's, it is diversity in general, but it's also diversity of expressed information from those people who are already diverse. So it's not just a matter of accepting information, but these people are innovative, actually seek out information that's very different. Yeah, I think if you have different life experiences, different viewpoints, you bring diverse perspectives. And when those diverse perspectives are brought to a table, there's friction, there's sparks, but sparks, sparks cause innovation. And uh, obviously we talk a lot these days about the need for you know, racial, gender, and other types of diversity. Those are incredibly important because people from different backgrounds have had different life experiences and different ways of interacting with people. You also need people from diverse backgrounds when it's 
like the founders of our country, all of whom were white males writing the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. But when you bring a John Adams and a Thomas Jefferson together, they have very diverse perspectives and it helps. The team at Intel, as I said, had that, that sense of engineering. Steve Jobs had that when he created the team in Apple. And over and over again, here in New Orleans, I watch whether it's creating food or creating music or creating technology or medical services, it's the teams that bring both personal diversity and background and experience and intellectual diversity in terms of perspective. Those are the ones that tend to be the most creative. And so uh, to, to get this information together and this express diversity, I, I know that in, in your work too, we talk a little bit about physical proximity and that's kind of interesting today, isn't it? When we're sequestered and we're all on Zoom calls instead of actually meeting and shaking hands and doing those things. But I think many of these innovators believe that physical proximity was important to their ability to have those debates and still be human. Yes, yeah, Steve Jobs believed in physical proximity, which is why when he designed the Pixar headquarters or the new Apple headquarters, you almost had to go through common space to get anywhere, to a bathroom, to a cafeteria, to a screening room, because he wanted people to bump into each other and have serendipitous encounters. But I think one of the things we've learned in the past, you know, this, this year of the plague is that uh, virtual meetings can be very good, especially if we can look at people eye to eye, if we can listen to people, if we can see their body language, and we have to get together uh, even if it's not physically, get together and exchange ideas. We can't just uh, do it on Slack channels as we have to have meetings like the ones you and I are having, where we get to look at people, talk at people, and go back and forth. And so I think our workplaces will change. Uh, I'm writing a book now about people involved in biotechnology, and I'm wrestling with the issue of when is it important that they all actually get together physically and when is it important that they can have Skype and Zoom and Microsoft team meetings? And we're going to have to learn that in the future. And the good thing, I mean, one of the silver linings about this social isolation we've been going through is we're learning to do by doing it. We're learning to f invent the future. And we're experiencing uh, things that we would never have experienced had we not been forced into them, would you say? I mean... Yeah, and I think we're experiencing new ways to interact with people, new ways to have meetings, and we're going to have to get the blend and balance right when the waters recede and the earth begins to heal and this plague is done with, which is uh, we are going to be hungry for physical proximity. But in the meantime, and even afterwards, we're going to say, and we have to keep it going with virtual uh, proximity. It one point you, you make that struck me when we talk about diverging or divergent points of view being the impetus for, for innovation is you talk about this um, almost competitiveness of an internally um, closed system and one that's a more open system as sort of Microsoft slash Apple is the way I read it in my head confluence that actually creates something better than either one on their own. Is that you know, the way you feel? Yeah. You know, we look at different ways and different systems. One of the most important in the information technology space has been the idea of a closed proprietary system, which Apple is the exemplar, meaning if you're using the iPhone hardware, you got to be using the iPhone software. And if you're using iTunes, you have to use the iTunes software and get the content from the iTunes store. It's an end-to-end -end curated garden, a walled garden in which there's end-to-end -end control, partly because Steve Jobs had in his fingertips a bit of a control freak uh, feel for things. And that makes for a beautiful walled garden, like the gardens in Kyoto that Steve Jobs loved to walk in. The other way of doing things, including what Microsoft does with its um, uh, Windows and other software, is it can run on any piece of hardware. You can run it on a Dell or a Hewlett Packard or a Compaq or in the old days an IBM PC. 
We see that playing out now in the world of the phone between the Android, which is an open system that'll run on any piece of hardware, and a closed system that'll, uh, which is what Apple iPhones have. That is a type of thing in which there's no one right answer. Sometimes the world gets moved forward by things that are done tightly controlled and proprietary. And sometimes it gets moved forward like a new Linux, you know, Linux operating systems where anybody can just build on it. And we're going to see that in biotechnology too. Some people are going to create proprietary ways of doing testing for coronavirus or even proprietary platforms for using DNA vaccines. Other people are going to say, I'm going to have this invention, but I'm going to, and I'll uh, profit from it but I'll license it around very freely. And that will cause an expansion of the market. We saw Bell Labs do that in the 40s when it invented the transistor. I think it was worried about being attacked for having a monopoly. So instead of just keeping that transistor proprietary, they licensed it at a pretty low fee to hundreds of organizations, which is why you end up getting Texas Instruments and Intel and Fairchild and so many other places. So I hope we're gonna see that in the biotech space, but we have to realize that the competition between a proprietary model and an open model is a good competition to have. Yeah, and, and, and we only move forward through the kind of debate of different views, right? And so yes, it's a Hegelian to... dialectic as we were taught in college, although I still don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I was, I was, I've read it a little uh, twice because I'm looking at it in the, the description of the, the way the internet evolved, a collaborative technology based with collaborative people trying to figure it out. Um, one of the interesting things I heard somebody say once is that the value of technology is really directly related to the, the value or the way it pro propels forward relational activity. Does, does this piece of technology increase our ability to be re able to relate in valuable ways? Do you agree with that? I think connectivity and community are the killer apps of any great technology. And I think it happened with the internet, which is, you know, it was done in this collaborative way where graduate students across America were all chipping in with the original, you know, RFCs, requests for comment to see how it was made. And I think at Time Magazine we wrote that it was done in that way so that it would survive a Russian attack because you know you couldn't sort of take out one part and then the whole thing would fall apart. It was all interconnected. And uh, that's not true. It was done that way because the, they wanted collaboration to be part of the DNA of the internet. And when you look even at the early online services like America Online, it begins to thrive because it connects people, that you've got mail. You and I are old enough to remember that phrase. And this ability to connect people and form communities is what becomes a killer app for online services. So I think when we talk about collaboration and when we talk about this current age of coronavirus, we're collaborating virtually. We have to look at how well our technologies bring us together rather than uh, help divide us. And for sure, it, it can do either, right? So what can be made for good can be made for not so good. I, we're seeing that now. Yeah, and you know, you're in a really unique position, Walter, in my opinion, to look at this, having been in the media for so long and run media companies at CNN and Time and, and looked at it globally from the Aspen Institute, of course. But when you're a media person and you look at the Facebooks of the world today using the social platforms built on the internet that could be for good or not so good or both, um, what's your take on the leader's responsibility today to use technology for the betterment of society? Because it's an interesting question today, right? Mark Zuckerberg, other people who created these, including Google, their mantra was they wanted to do good. They wanted to connect the world. They wanted to do no harm, do no evil. 
And for a very long time, the good that came from these social media platforms far outweighed the bad that was caused by them. It, you know, as much as I like being a gatekeeper as editor of Time Magazine, I realized the world was a better place when anybody could publish, anybody could have a blog, anybody could post their different opinions or create content and even music and songs and share them on a YouTube or a Twitter or a Facebook. However, the algorithms and the financial and business model of both Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, many of these places uh, encouraged enragement in a way, because they, they were trying to get people engaged. Well, the way sometimes to get them engaged is to enrage them, to say outrageous things, to make them inflame their hatreds. And so the algorithm started to reward people who had the loudest voices or were the most divisive. And you see that on Twitter, you see that on Facebook. And when we were producing magazines, newspapers, and even blogs or online services, we took responsibility for what happened on our platform. In the really olden days that only you and I remember, Stuart Brand wrote a phrase called, you own your own words. And it was part of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And when you logged onto the well, which was the earliest of the online communities, it said, you own your own words. In other words, you were responsible. You were held responsible and the platform felt responsible for not spreading hatred, for not spreading misinformation. Nowadays, Facebook and Twitter and most of the social media platforms thrive by spreading hatred, misinformation, inaccuracies, falsehoods, and they don't have to do that. It's not like government should censor them or tell them what to do, but they should be responsible. They should say, hey, we got into this business because we wanted to make the world a better place. Even if we can make a bit more money by spreading hatreds and falsehoods and things we know are you know, uh, fraudulent coming from foreign you know, people interfering with us or coming from hate groups trying to inflame us. We don't do that. Just like you and I don't do things in our lives that would be fraudulent or hateful. And so I think we should push the social media companies now to say, you got to stop some of this hatred. You got to stop some of this poison and fraudulent uh, stuff that's going on especially now when our democracies are fragile, when our health is being threatened, and when lies have consequences. Well, that's really well said. A couple quick questions um, for you, Walter, before, before you go. Um, what are you reading? You must be just incessant reader because everything is I, I read is so well documented and enthralling to me. What are you reading today? Well, I'm working and reading uh, all the letters and writings that Jeff Bezos ever did, his shareholder letters, his memos, because we're doing a collection that'll come out in November of, with you know Jeff Bezos of his writings. I'm writing the introduction to it and trying to put it in perspective. It's gonna be published both by the Harvard Business Review and Harcourt, I think, uh, uh, Public Affairs Press. Uh, so I've been reading him as a disruptive, innovative leader. I've also been reading a lot about biotechnology because that's what I'm writing about next. And a very old book that I find, two old books that I find inspiring. One is called The Eighth Day of Creation by Horace Judson. And it's just a beautiful journey of discovery written, I think, in the 1970s or 80s about biology and how the cell and the inner workings of our body are so interesting. And likewise, I've been reading the, rereading The Double Helix by James Watson, which is a detective tale about how you figure out the structure of DNA, but also how it's a human quest filled with rivalries and collaborations. Two leaders, Walter, living or dead, who most influenced your thinking or you most admire? Well, Ben Franklin, of course, and we need him now more than ever. As I said, he's the person who united us rather than divided us. He was not the most aggressive, disruptive person at the Constitutional Convention or the Declaration, 
But frankly, nowadays, we have a lot of aggressive, disruptive, divisive people. He was the one who could bring us together, unite us, and calm the waters. He even had a trick where he had a, a little vial of oil in his cane, and he had a button. He could open it up, and there'd be he'd walk past the pond with people and there'd be waves and he'd touch it with his cane and it would calm the waters. And so nowadays I feel we need people like Benjamin Franklin. Um, and I guess obviously I, I feel an affinity to Leonardo da Vinci. I think we're going to succeed when we connect the arts and the sciences. Yeah, it's, I, when I start reading your work, through every page, I begin to see how our backgrounds really determine a lot of our thinking and how passion for both is necessary, more love and more science, right? Yeah, One I think thing, those who stand at the intersection will be the Steve Jobses of the future. The one thing, if I'm a millennial or a Gen Z leader, like in your class, I come to your class at Tulane, professor, and I come up to you and I say, the one thing that you could leave me with as a young leader that could shorten my trails, the one piece of advice you give me, what would it be? Know your talents. We often say, follow your passion. That's not true. You know, it's, it's not just about your silly or important passions. It's about connecting your passions to something larger than yourself. Anybody can go run off and follow a passion, but you got to connect your passion to something that's more enduring and more lasting and larger than yourself. And that involves understanding your key strengths, whether you're a disruptive manager, whether you're a person of talent who can create things, what it may be. Say, how do I take my talents and collaborate with other people? Because it isn't just about me. It's about creating a better society. Walter, I can't thank you enough. I can't. Especially. Gary, it's great to be with you. It's, it's, it's just um your wisdom your challenging my thinking through reading your books and i especially am thankful for your passion for bringing society together to collaborate in search of a better society in the future should be a lesson for us all i really appreciate it walter thank you thank you you know we all could do that we have that bred into us and uh we could set our minds to it right now, which is we know the solutions to a lot of our problems. We know the proper way to behave towards other people. Let's just set about doing that for a change. And, and I don't think there's a better definition of leadership than the one you just gave. And I'd also like to thank the Washington Speakers Bureau for making this conversation possible. And I'd like to thank them for their commitment to helping us find different ways to create cultures that are more collaborative more effective and more human in the future. Thank you, WSB. Thank you, Walter, and thanks for watching.